اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجه فرجه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته خطو محاو لما شهر الله Ara masedi abelilun. Ska rziba. Um, insha Allah. Um, re fitisa matiri soho. The Imam of our time. Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. On the death anniversary of Mewaruna. Fatima Maksuma. Salamu la alayhi. Fitisa matiriso. Ho diskola tarona. Fitisa matiriso ho ma muslimi. Liluna. Babu geli. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu wa skali tiba aratamai. Akitamai kili mung, tamali awa Sheikh Mururisi Hussein Nchinyane. At smiling Sheikh, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. So inshallah. Just one minute or the camera inshallah. Before we Uh, okay, so um, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على خير خلقه أجمعين محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى محمد uh, رب شرح لي صدر ويسر لي أمر وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي so uh, عربك ليدي فاطمة المعصومة the, the queen of قم المقدسة um, Before we talk about her, we have to take a back. We have to go uh, a step back. We have to read a backstory about uh, who she is. So that we understand who she is, we have to take a step back. So when we take the step back, we have to look in the life of her brother, Imam uh, Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, salamullahi alayhima. So, um, It so happened that during the time of Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, uh, he was summoned or sort of forced to migrate to where he is, uh, where he was martyred and buried today, Mashhad al-Muqaddasa in the far east of Iran, one of Persia. So in Khurasan. 
Thus, it is, thus that area is called today Mashhad, meaning the place where Shahada happened, the place where martyrdom happened. So that's where Imam Musa, Imam Ali bin Musa was taken. Al Ma'mun, Al Ma'mun had appointed him as his crown prince, as his heir, as his heir apparent. Uh, so after appointing him as his heir apparent, Diallo, he forced him to migrate to Maru, or what is today known as Mashhad, in, Khur, in the province of Khurasan. So he took him from there, and then he brought him to Maru. Now, after a year or so, um, the brothers of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, uh, like the one who, the one where, the one whose shrine was attacked a few days or a few uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Shah Chirag, who was the brother of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, his shrine was attacked uh, in Shiraz. Uh, so, um, three guys went into the shrine. Imagine it's a shrine first of all, so it's a place of burial. It's a place where uh, where holy personalities are buried. And then because of that, it is after that it is a place of worship. Then people came in with AK forty sevens and they started shooting at pilgrims. Fourteen people were um, uh, were killed, including women, including children. The video is horrendous. You don't want to see that. So a year later, after Imam Ali ibn Musa was taken, Shah Shirag, uh, Lady Ma'suma, and other uh, relatives of the Imam wanted to visit him. They wanted to visit him in Maru. So they came from Medina, traveling from Medina, coming via Kufa, coming. Now, you know almost how governments are. Um, they, they have their spies who give them information. So the information that had gotten to the government officials is that there is a group. There is a group of people who are traveling to Mashhad and it looks like they are militarized and it looks like they are gaining support along the way towards Mashhad, you see. So that was the first, pro that was what happened. So as they were traveling from Medina to Kufa to uh, to uh, Shira, uh, Shiraz, Neshabur, and so on and so forth. When they got somewhere, when they got somewhere, now they were, uh, Al Ma'mun had sent his soldiers towards these people and trying to tell them to go back. They're like, no, but we are just, we just want to visit our brother, we just want to visit our Imam in Maru. That's all we want. We don't want to, we're not here fighting and whatnot. But just like it happened to Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam, it happened to these brothers of the relatives of Imam Ali ibn Musa al rida So uh, they were ambushed, attacked, killed, and so on. Thus, many of them, thus many of the brothers of Imam Ali ibn Musa al rida are buried in Iran, like Shah, Shira, you see. So when that whole debacle happened, when that whole attack happened, that skirmish happened, uh, this lady, Fatima, uh, the sister of Imam Ali ibn Musa al rida was with this group of people who wanted to visit the Imam alayhi salam. So during this skirmish, she managed to sort of flee. You know, she was taken, she, uh, she was taken by a group of people that kept her safe until they got to a place called Qum. Now, in that place, she fell ill. You know, she fell ill, she became sick, and that is where she um, passed on and was buried. And that place today is that place that we know today. So, um, generally, the ladies of Ahlul Bayt, you don't know much, details, uh, much detail about their lives, but this particular lady is a special one, such that her shrine... It's one of the biggest shrines, actually. Uh, a very uh, beautiful one. Uh, such that the hadith from Imam Musa, uh, Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada himself, who says that uh, one who wants to visit me and they visit my sister, then it is as if they have visited me in Mashhad. So this is the maqam of this special lady, uh, Lady Fatima al-Ma'asuma, uh, salawatullahi wa salamuhu. عليها
that is just a brief story about her and how she ended up in home. So uh, it is on this day uh, today uh, that, according to historians, of course, that she was martyred and buried in Qum on this day, as uh, our esteemed host uh, has mentioned. Shukran lila, hale boe, hila, tati muruti. Shabisa di shuong tabaur. Haritibi e kabo mewaruna, not only ye na mewaruna, Fatima Mahsuma salamu laili. Insha Allah, May this be king, sort of like an, an encouragement, inshallah. Come on, even if it's not a lot, just a little. There are those mini biographies, inshallah. Uh, the king, scholars, we can ask them as well. Moving to today's topic, inshallah, as protest, the truth is that the sensitive topic is hijab. From last week, some of us felt sorry; it wasn't enough. Inshallah, today we will talk about the benefits. Pick up and go in depth. Ka men's hijab. So, and other questions. Inshallah, Rakuba, our Sheikh, Kene, Koyo, Nahanyani, and then retire for the benefits. Inshallah. Sorry, I can't trust him. Oh, this week we supposed to um retweetle pelika topic ya hijab ager. So amongst the things that we will discuss are the benefits. Who tell you later? Go men's hijab. I think retweetle mo di mo fela last week. Si kepe zul. Um. So before we go into the benefits, yeah, and other questions, inshallah, go ba. We tell you later, Hanyan, inshallah. Oh, okay, yeah, men's hijab, men's hijab. Um, whenever who uh, who this discussion, yeah, hijab, uh, the discussion, the 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 question or the discussion about men's hijab always arises. It always uh, arises. Um, and uh, it is a fact that Lurna, as scholars, sometimes we don't do justice to the topic. Uh, we don't treat it as important as it is. Um, last week, in Kahupla enclosure, the last thing that we mentioned was that hijab, in, the, in the discussion it, it appeared, but then we closed with this as a reminder as well. We recapped with it uh, as a reminder as well, that hijab is not only dressing modestly, but hijab is also acting chastely, being chaste. So uh, the difference being what modesty is how you dress, chastity is how you behave. So hijab is equals to modesty plus chastity. That is what we said last week, I guess. So when it comes to the topic of hijab, what applies mostly, especially when it comes to the rulings, when it comes to um, uh, the jurisprudential side of it, what applies more to women is 
the hijab of modesty. We have to separate the two. So the hijab of women has to be like 75% modesty, basically the way they dress, and 25% chastity. Because of course, uh, when you are dressed, uh, when you are dressed in that way, it's hard. It's hard not to be chased anyway. Then, on the flip side, uh, the hijab of men is seventy-five percent chastity and twenty-five percent modesty. What does this mean? That the hijab of men is mostly about how they behave, mostly about how they think about more women, mostly about how they talk to and about women, then 25% about how they dress. We have to make this, this, uh, this, disting this distinction. It's very important that we note this. Um, I'm sure, uh, I don't want to blow my own horn, but based on the lectures that I've heard about hijab, this is the first time somebody has mentioned this in South Africa, that we have to create this distinction between the hijab of men and women. The, the hijab of men is mostly chastity. The hijab of women is mostly modesty. Yes, hijab means both. You have to be chaste and you have to be modest. But that of men is mostly on the chastity side and that of women is mostly on the modesty side. You see, because, uh, you know, there's that uh, famous hadith, I'm sure everyone is familiar with it, that uh, that speaks about the desires of men and women. It says that um, women have 90% desire and 90% shyness. And then men have 10% desire, uh, but they have 10% shyness as well. Or this is. So women, because of their nature, already chastity is built in. So jurisprudentially, what is most important for them is the modesty side. Whereas for the men, jurisprudentially, what is most important for them is the chastity side. But yes, both men and women need to have both chastity and modesty. All right. This is when we talk about hijab in general. You see, so now, how, how does this apply? When you look at the verses again, chapter number 24, Verse number 30 and verse 31. It starts by addressing the men. It starts by addressing the men. It starts by addressing the men. What does it say? It says, tell them to lower their gaze. So it's an address to the men to address mostly. And Bona, it starts by talking to men when it talks to hijab. So that it tells them, look, guys. Your, the way you dress maybe will 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 uh, will will deal with the way certain men in the modern age dress. We'll talk about that now, but just as a concept of hijab, the Quran says, "You men, don't cast down your gaze, protect your private parts." Most importantly, this is for you. Most importantly, cast down your gaze. So, as I said, uh, the 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 narration of. Uh, Jesus Christ, when, wherein he says, Moses used to order you not to look at women. I am ordering you not to look at the clothes of women. So it's about men being chaste. Number, primarily. And then, um, on when it comes to the women, yes, it also tells them, but because their nature already deals with it, it tells them, okay, cast down your gaze. Um, Cast down your gaze, protect your private parts. But their nature is okay with that. That's why most of the second verse, verse number 31, deals with who or uh, how they should uh, dress, not to show their ornaments. As you said, not me. Uh, not to show their ornaments, not to show their beauty, except what is common uh, thereof which the Mufassirin or scholars have said it's their face and their hands and so on and so forth. But what tells them that, no, uh, don't strike the earth in a way that you should be known or be recognized and so on and so forth. You see, that's 
the hijab of women. It, it tells them how to dress, basically. And then in jurisprudence, there it goes on. Uh, there are further discussions about that. What is interesting, uh, just to add, because what is interesting is that in the verse, um, chapter number 33, verse number 59, the second verse that we quoted last time from Surah Al-Ahzab, uh, the one that says that they should wear jalabi um, uh, they should wear jilbab, which is sort of like a long shirt that covers the whole body. Uh, some say that covers from the head to the ankles. Some say it co- covers from the neck to the ankles, that jilbab. Or when, that verse, chapter 33, verse 39. What it says is, uh, this is better. I guess we were having that discussion, Khurno. Some say, no, it was only for slave women, blah, blah, blah. And then it gets to a part where it says, um, so that the woman do- should not be tormented. So there's a discussion here from the Mufassirin. From the Mufassirin. Uh, if, you, if you can, they, I got to copy a Quran. And unfortunately, I'm not half of the Quran. I'm ashamed to say that. But, hey. um, chapter 33, verse 59. The Mufassirin, some say that, yeah, no, they should dress in this way so that um, they are not tormented. I mean, However, there's another interpretation which makes more sense, which actually says, oh, you men, because they are dressed that way, do not annoy them. So I want our happy, it emphasizes, not necessarily because they are dressed that way, but generally, oh, you men, do not torment women. And you think, chapter 33, verse 59. Well, it mentions that. So again, it mentions the hijab of men. Kori, be chaste. Be careful of how you deal with women, how you talk with women, how you talk about women. You see, that is the hijab of men primarily. As, as we said, the distinction is hijab is equals to hijab is, hijab is equals to modesty plus chastity. But that of men will be 75% chastity, 25% modesty. That of women will be 75% modesty and 25% um, uh, chastity. You see, that's the distinction that is there. Now, coming to the uh, Akid, uh, if you want to chip in before I go into the jurisprudential uh, discussion about men's clothing. Uh, quick one. Sure. You said, um, Davaelea, do not strike the earth. Um, does that, that, is it literally, is it literally saying that women should not strike the earth like boys? Yeah, um, which means that Rata me okwa izel. Okay, uh, oh, so again, <laughs> again, uh, referring to the to as we broke down the verse last week. Really, first of all, we have to look at the situation when the verse was revealed, and then the reason why the verse was revealed. So, uh, if you read in the history of the Arab Peninsula, you will hear about red flag districts red flag districts which are basically what they are today yeah where um uh, certain women do a particular job so but this part about uh, uh, striking your feet is not necessarily about red red flag districts it is more about um, it is more about how women would get the attention of men. So uh, it is said that at the time the women would wear marking uh, ankle bracelets. They would wear ankle bracelets, uh, and then or then they would tap their feet, and then the bracelets would shake. 
that's getting the attention of the men. Well, this is reminds me of this old Hugo Boss advert. <laughs> that's what that's what the women used to do at the time. They would tap their 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 ankles so that the the the, the ankle bracelets would shake to get the attention of the men. That is what used to happen at the time. Now, the interpretation of this is, it, it begs the question now. So, can women, for example, do certain sports? Can women run? Can women do this? Can women do that? That becomes another discussion now because uh, when anyone runs, certain body parts shake. which is natural, whether that person is male or female, certain body parts shake, you see, and then that's, that maybe creates a certain spectacle for uh, spectators, then they start making certain comments, you see. This is another discussion now, can uh, women then participate in sports, for example, running, um, play, uh, play sports or, or something like that. Half one. Uh, so, yeah, and a uh, uh, king, the way we are sports, king to Israel, real sweet. Cause even more, they say, Modi King, constitution, everyone has right to religion, but mm. they don't allow us to practice it fully. When or workplaces that have sports teams, they will come up with so many rules. They uh, maybe because hijabu kia na e bonahala nga ul. But Larry, if uh, we allow you horu u apare scarf, then maybe are um, o practice a religion ya hai, you know? And na kweo, this thing doesn't, I twani loom up or something more let's say kid yeah like jazia ball maybe i don't know louia because it will be the same as uh if timmy papa like a jazzy whitey would up or ask up white you know but they come up with a whole lot of excuses says i'm hurry or sky practice are fully your religion you know it's a shame and the gamo a the rona ravata equal the the opposite gender a whole every end up a compromise one another uh question you said a couple hand you said 90 percent shyness women are naturally born with 90% percent 90% desire. And then men, the opposite. 10% desire, 10% shyness. Now, this is why men will catcall women more because they don't have that shyness. So yeah, that that's um, the nature of men and women compared to uh, men uh, uh, don't have until. Let's see, there's a comment here. Yes, um, yeah. Men have their chinas naturally. They don't have their chinas, so that is why it's, it's easier for men to. Um, approach women than it is for women to approach um, the men. However, uh, if you you look at the nature of 
men and women, it is women who um, have the stronger desire. Hey. So to to move on further to the discussion entry uh, about uh, men's hijab, to move on further to the, to that discussion is first of all you have to understand <laughs> please when you when you uh, watch live please interact with us via uh, the comments uh, we enjoy it it gives us a certain atmosphere here so yeah for the laughs but um the first and for, um, uh, the first and most important thing that we have to understand is the fundamental difference between men and women. So then making their hijab also different. Hijab is modesty plus uh, chastity, Akir. But that of men, the hijab of men focuses more on their chastity and the hijab of women focuses more on their modesty because of the difference in, in the nature of both genders. I guess that's number one. Now, coming to the jurisprudential side of the discussion of men's hijab, this is uh, very important. Uh, there's, a, there's a brother on, 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 uh, on, on Facebook who posted a picture of himself. Uh, let me not describe it for to protect his identity, but he posted a picture of himself doing some uh, yard work without a t-shirt. So I'm like, hey, when, uh, be careful. Sisters will come for you, hey, hijab, this and that. Then he's like, no, but in my fiqh, in the Maliki fiqh, uh, the, the minimum requirement for a man to wear is from the navel to the knees. So if you have, for example, getting like like ihram yeah i'm sure you've seen people of i'm sure you've seen pictures of people at at hajj i get you've seen pictures of people at hajj and how they dress so it's the one cloth that covers the upper body and then the other one that covers the lower body that one that they put it by the by the navel the belly button and then it goes below the knees by one so basically that is enough for a man to wear. That is enough. I want, according to Mal Maliki jurisprudence, Alhamdulillah. According to uh, um, Ja'afari Fiqh, it's, I'm, I'm not going to say how, uh, how much it is, but it's less than that. Yeah. It's, it's less than that. I want. But you know, this is something else that comes into play something else that comes into play. And uh, just to give you an example of this something else is, for example, all these ulama, all these scholars, all these marajah, they know that the minimum, um, the clergy, they know that the minimum to wear uh, is from the navel to the knees, for example. I said that in Jafar if it's less, go find out for yourself. But you'll never see any of them dressed like that. Why? Why will you not? Why will you not go to Iraq? Why will not not go to um, uh, American pronunciation Iraq and find any clergy scholar dressed like that? Go to Iran as well. Same thing come to South Africa myself or any other member of Muaki Council of Scholars, you'll never find them dressed like that anyway. Instead, especially in those uh, two countries that I mentioned, adding Lebanon there, um, adding Eastern Saudi Arabia, Qatif and Ahsa areas, you'll find the clergies dressed even on a hot day, they are dressed the most. They got their dishtasha, they got their saya or their jubba, Second layer, which is itself layered, and then they got the abba, the one, that, the cloak that they put by their shoulders. Every day, minimum, minimum. Those are 
they got three clothes on minimum. All these three clothes going from the neck to the ankle plus cabin. Cabin is not, it's not very heavy, it's not bad. Eh? You feel it after some time. <laughs> they are, why? Why are they always wear dress like that? Yes, you can go to the argument that it's soon uh, recommended and so on and so forth. But what I want to bring forth is what there's something else that governs, which is orf, customs, norms of a society. And this is what guides. Last week I mentioned that men are generally not don't don't generally have a problem with they generally don't have a problem with dressing up more. That's why uh, men when they go for uh, the example I made is that men men go for interview they'll wear a vest, a shirt, a waistcoat, and a jacket. Whereas women when they go for an interview, just a dress. That's it. You see, or the norms and customs of society govern. They have a say in the rulings. You see, so in South Africa, uh, in South Africa now, a man, a man aged twenty-five, is expected to wear at least jeans. Jeans, maybe loose, maybe tight, but not tight around the the private area, the private part area. Uh, at least a t-shirt short sleeve t-shirt at least that is what a man in South Africa is expected to wear so the ORF governs that a man should wear this this is the ORF the, the norms, the customs of South Africa for example, they govern that that is the minimum that a man should wear the trend or the fashion of men wearing short pants, especially in public is very recent, uh, I have to say. I mentioned last week as well that in the 70s, if you wear short pen as an adult, it was clear evidence that you're unemployed. Or it was clear evidence that you've not made it. All right. So the customs, they also govern how men wear. And this is important because, and this is important, especially for us as Muslims, because this is not then uh, 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 impede us in acting out or uh, um, practicing our religion fully. I mentioned last week that a man, um, when a man dresses, uh, especially the private part between his knees and his navel, uh, whatever he wears should not show the shape, size, and color. Of the private of the private parts again, shape, size, or color thereof. So shape, it has it cannot be too tight. Size, it cannot be too tight. Color, it cannot be see through. The color the the color must be solid, such that you cannot see what is behind it. This is what is expected of men to wear according to Islamic law. So out of my fashion, I just pants, the tight. Yeah, it's got me so I last seen him. Yes, yes. I put it up with this with pen, then I'll have to come class, and then I... My heart fell. Then that's not... Uh, that's now contravening with your fiqh. It's going against your Islamic laws. It's going against your Islamic laws. Yes, here the customs must not break the laws of the religion. That's the thing. See, so, yeah. Tight t-shirt. <sighs> Tight t-shirt. This upper body is not a private part for men, so I can't really say anything about that. It's more about the lower part, you know, the lower uh, body. <laughs> That's where the problem is. And she's back. Uh, while you were absent, I was just 
explaining further about men's hijab. You missed it. You'll see it on YouTube. the <laughs> important part. And we were, we were actually uh, talking about that today. The, one of my sisters. Because you know us in San, very... Uh, Naruto see a Rahul Waban because the way a fetching your own as a young thing that's exactly what we're going to see in the next five years. Motu Jabe a couple of the pogs are a now observing a hijab hijab yabana he only comes in the private part, you know. Yes, that's that's what I was explaining. <laughs> that's what I was explaining now. Kiri, according to Malik Efeb, what or uh, basically uh, the ruling star Ali Sunnah, uh, what's minimum to wear is from for men is from the muhuba, the navel up until the knees. That's the minimum. But for Jafar Efeb, it's less. I didn't I didn't specify how less, but it's less. So what you're saying, yeah, no, somebody put up a box, blah, 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 blah. This is answered by orf, the customs, the norms of a society uh, dictate how people should dress at that time. So I made an example. For, for example, 25-year-old man in South Africa is expected to wear at least jeans. They may be tight, they may be loose, but they must not be tight around the private parts. And then a t-shirt, short sleeve t-shirt. This is the minimum required for a South African man to wear, according to the customs of our land. Fashion, yadi short pen and whatnot, especially in public, is very recent. Unless it was a guardian. Right, Cadin Kim Pesago Jarring, Kim Trefelang. Ah, Otolo and Alima Scrum, over Jetor Barajan. So, eh, Cooper, Cooper, Peter, you go, eh, the benefits, the hijab, inshallah. Ah, okay, go on. Ah, eight of us are in a couple because. The benefits that I'm going to quote, the benefits that I'm going to mention, they are by scripture. I can only quote them, but I can't even explain them because they don't relate to me and stuff like that. But um, dressing up, dressing up generally, generally, you know, generally speaking, dressing up and dressing up in a particular way, it gets you certain reactions. For example, this is an informal setup. I'm here at Kishapili Sport Isaka. I should actually get uh, this printed smiling sheikh or Muahi Council of Scholars and sell merchan merchandise, inshallah. <laughs> yeah, hit the like button if you'd, if you'd buy a smiling sheikh bucket hat. But Oban, this is an informal setup. And then um, it being informal, I'm just dressed in my golf t-shirt, jeans, bucket hat, you understand? And that's it. But if, for example, I was going out or I was going to meet somebody and then you go there maybe in a shirt, maybe a tie, bow tie, you know, in a shirt, in a bow tie, a jacket or a waistcoat with formal pants, then I'll let say, hey, don't forget the crease. Must be there, the line there. Yeah. Then when you present yourself like that, you get a certain reaction. In that way, okay, I see two likes now, so it means people will buy the smiling sheikh merch. 
inshallah. <laughs> but <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is when you dress in that certain way, you're going to get a, a, a reaction different from when you are de- dressed in a different way. So if I now come uh, in a suit, three-piece suit, waistcoat, jacket, iron tie and everything, uh, rings, polished, watch, a shine now, you'll get a certain reaction. They'll be like, oh, no, mashallah, this person is presenting himself in a respectful way. And then... Um, it works like that. So the reactions that I get when I'm wearing a suit compared to when I'm wearing just jeans and a t-shirt uh, compared to the reactions I get when I'm in my turban and my whatnot and my turban and my full attire, they are, they are different. So I want to assume, I don't know, because my hijab is about chastity more. Guys, your hijab is about chastity more. Please stop sliding into people's DMs too much, guys. Come on. Ay, Marlo, Nagan. Ay, I'm defending. Ay. Sometimes. I. Anyway, anyway. So I want to assume that because of the reactions, that the different reactions that I get when I'm dressed in different ways, I want to assume that it's, it's the same for women. Um, uh, Oh, yes. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I love that comment. I love that comment. You see that comment there? He, he, he. MashaAllah. I know we're going pre- gonna to have Smiling Sheikh merchandise soon <laughs> to support the channel. So I want to assume that when um, a woman, because I have sisters, and then there was, there was a time some of them were not wearing... Um, job full time, then they won't. So when they tell me, they're like, no. Uh, last week I was sister. This week, because I'm wearing hijab, I'm mamzo. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm assuming, I don't know, Kubutra Kawen, please teach me. I have a daughter to teach, so you teach me so that I can impart the knowledge. Uh-uh. Last week, we'll get there under the bus. Eh? One well, okay. One of the benefits that's actually mentioned in the uh, in the Quran that's mentioned in the Quran, you are in chapter thirty-three, verse fifty-nine, is that. Why um sorry? Oh alhamdulillah. Right before I can get about this week. We go Arabella from an Islamic perspective, inshallah. Um, but before <laughs> before you take it, ne kupa ung why um do you guys uh, dress like the whole government situation Halim when you give lectures and talks and whatnot as opposed to like a now situation yeah a bucket hat and a golf t-shirt and sometimes Others bad inter immediately after the lecture. Why is that? Pinky ring. Uh, that is for the sake of uniformity. Uh, first, uh, first, first of all, it is for the sake of uniformity and uniformity ailing for a global. So this is uh, that's reason number one. But further going to the, into that reason, it's because 
Uh, it's how the Prophet used to dress. Obviously, he always had a turban. He always had an abaya, a, a cloak from on his shoulders, and then he also had um, not necessarily tishtasha as in one piece in korta. No, like, but he had an uh, undergarment, maybe sort of like what well, I don't know, but sort of like what um, our brothers in West Africa wear. And our brothers in Pakistan way, but when the two piece situation, and then uh, something over that, and then the uh, the abaya that goes on your shoulders. Abaya actually is so it it, it, it it's in so many cultures that it goes as far as Japan. In Japan, what do they call it? A kimono. It's not a garment. It's just something you throw over your shoulders. What this is. Uh, in even in Europe, they have something like that. I guess you have a jacket and you have a coat. So, uh, okay, I, I'm diver, I'm uh, I'm digressing here. Why do we wear that? It's because of uh, in the Hausa where we are taught uh, that is what we, what we are taught for Giona formal scholar outfit ew. So if you're going to present yourself in a formal setup as a scholar, you want to go dressed as a scholar. And yes, many of us, as soon as, especially in summer, as soon as I'm done with the lecture, I take off the turban because you'll find my hair sweating and whatnot and stuff like that. Come you're wearing three, wapere kurta, wapere jubba, wapere abaya, wachis. But the reason why we wear that is because of until for uniformity that globally um, scholars dress like that. Otherwise, here I'm, I'm, I, uh, me not dressing like that does not okay. mean I'm a scholar. Politics, I'm a rune. It's burgundy, okay? Yeah, it's burgundy. Right, uh, Mr. Brigetti, politics, does it have to be exactly like that? Like, can't um, Asians have their own way or have it in a culture? Because to us, it seems Asian, mm -hmm. you know. And the thing is. Uh, it seems Asian to us because uh, Rona, here we have been uh, so masterfully colonized to an extent so her normal clothes for us is a jean and a t-shirt. Or at least but when you go up north in Africa and not even far, like from East Africa, and Akir East Africa I'm talking about north of Mozambique and then West Africa, and I'm not even talking far up, just mo, mo, mo. Uh, what men usually wear it's two piece, a uh, pants and a shirt. But the shirt, yeah, it's designed in a way yeah, where it goes, I think you more taking fella. It goes lower, maybe up until your knees or even below your knees. I'm sure you, you saw Sadio Mane at the Ballon d'Or uh, event, how he was dressed. That is, that is how many Africans wear. That is how many Africans dress. And then you go even more north. You go even more north. So on both sides, either on the east and the west of Africa. And you get to Ethiopia, you get to um, to Sudan, you get to Chad, you get to Mauritania. There, wearing a turban is normal. Wearing a turban, everyone wears a turban, in fact, in those areas. Everyone, not even scholars. That's just how every man wears dresses. Oh, you think my 13 meter turban is big? Because, and this is the thing. Um, it's uh, this is a topic that my brother would enjoy a lot, uh, much. But these, the, that clothing is actually derived from Africa. When the way they dress, it's actually derived from Africa. But Akiriano, as time goes and whatnot. Ibilin Gari, it's Asian. So, for example, look at Arwan. I'm going to release to YouTube. 
chapter 7, verse 26, verse 32, and even something. Okay. Irene, I'll get I'll quickly jump and get my copy of the Quran so that we can um discuss this verse inshallah. So um for example, if if you look at this outfit in, in this avatar, in this picture here, okay, that one is not very clear. But it's like a shirt. Kurta thing is like a shirt, Chinese collar shirt, and then Wapirasaya or the jubba, which looks like a it looks like a coat or it even looks like a a, a jacket. Wabun. Looks like a jacket that you would wear with a suit. The only difference is that AI fell multi-king, it goes all the way to the ankles. <laughs> so yeah, it, we do say it's Asian and whatnot, but nah, man. And this is the, this is the thing. Uh, it differs. Our Sheba, for example, in in uh, between the eastern Saudi Arabia and Iraq. They prefer to wear it kakurt, that outfit. And then in Iran, they prefer to wear it with a shirt, like a normal shirt, but yeah, Chinese collar and normal formal pants. And then they wear the 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 jacket like robe over it. Then you go to Pakistan where they also wear it differently. But it's the same outfit nonetheless. I hope you yes. answered. Irkabu waju, irkilil kubia Quran. So, kishle. Shukran. Hello, what was your other question? I won't do it. Everyone, chapter number seven, verse number twenty-six to thirty-two. Surah Al-A'raf, verse number twenty-six to thirty-two. No, wrong, wrong phone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ya bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum wa risha, wa libasu taqwa thalika khair. Thalika min ayatillah la'allak, la'allahum yadhakkaroon, ya bani Adam, la yaftinannakum al-shaytanu kama akhraja abawikum min al-jannati yamzakum anhumah, libasu huma liuriyahuma sawatihima. إنه يراكم هو وقبيله من حيث لا ترونهم إن جعلنا الشياطين أولياء. ما شاء الله. This is actually a very beautiful verse of the Holy Quran, chapter number seven, verse number twenty-six to thirty-two. Uh, o Bani Adam, O children of Adam, uh, we have indeed revealed to you or taught you the uh, how to dress in a way that covers. Your nudity. Walibasu taqwa ghadhalika khair. But then the spiritual clothing, that is even better. Awan. That, dhalika khair. The spiritual clothing. Dhalika ayatullah la'allahum yadhakkaroon. And then it goes on. Up until verse 32. Very relevant verse, MashaAllah. Very relevant. Thank you. 
Oh, she's back. Can I question how you're monitoring before network you by this? Rest is for the weekend. I can take it due to weather or I didn't turn, but it keeps no, it must me be out. the weather. Ah, can I benefit your weather? It must be the weather because limo killing more, more, yeah, it's bad. Uh, inshallah, according to Islamic, from the Islamic perspective, the benefits. I got the best book in the world. Let's, let's, check. let's check. Let's check. Alhamdulillah. So, Nadi, Alan Halli Mari, Alan Halli Kim Zigwal, Snar Man of Rahim. Ya, you had Nabi, Holy Azwajik, Wabanatik, Wanisa El Mukmanim. You did Nina Ali Hina Minjala Bibi Hin, Valika Adina, and you are Rafna, Bala Vain. Wakana Lahu Rafur and Rahima. Yes, this is the verse, chapter number thirty nine of the Holy Quran, verse number fifty. 33, chapter number 33, sorry, Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 59. O you prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers that uh, that they wear their jalabib. As I said, it's sort of a dress. Yeah, it's a dress, not a skirt. Yeah, it's a dress that goes from the shoulders or from the head all the way to the ankles. Fine, article you. But today I can work out the benefits of hijab. Every time when we speak about hijab, we say that the benefit of hijab is that a woman is not sexualized. And when she's not sexualized or sexually objectified, it's she is met as an equal. She is met as a human being, not as an attractive, um, not as an attractive uh, being that can be flirted with, flattered or anything. So the verse of the Quran actually affirms this. It says, ذَلِكَ adina يُعْرَفْنَ That is so that at least they are acknowledged. So that at least they are known. With, uh, with due respect, um, if, for example, now, as a man, you meet a lady, I'm talking to the audience, you meet a lady who is dressed, for example, in a miniskirt, or even less than that, because they do that nowadays. <laughs> Your first instinct is that when you talk to her, you're going to come up with certain compliments or come up with certain uh, words of flattery to utter to her, again, instead of meeting her as a human being. If a lady now dressed in uh, the aforementioned way uh, asks for, for example, you are Abuti, Kista Kili, Kilatli Kazuki Chalet, the Kupatix, Kubuntu Sagachel Tatix. The first thing that you think about, the first thing that your mind goes to is that you are not on Panamba. Are you going to give me your number if I help you with the taxi fare? But if a lady now comes fully dressed, maybe in a dress or in a Suit, I like could they wear suits now, those skirt suits, those cute little skirt suits. <laughs> and then she's like, My brother, I'm in trouble. Can you please help me uh, with uh, my taxi fare? Then you're like, Oh, I need a sharp sister. You give it to her. The thing of, okay, no, flirt with her is secondary. And you are rough. That is the number one benefit of hijab, according to the Holy Quran, according to the Islamic text, that she is, she's treated as an equal before a, a being in a very beautiful being created by the most beautiful himself, Allah Azza wa Jal. 
Then it goes further. It says, Fala <laughs> This is the this is the part where I said that there are two interpretations. The first interpretation says, um, because they are dressed that way, so they must not be tormented, which it's correct, but it doesn't suffice. So it means when a woman is not dressed that way, or it goes against the hijab of men, which is chastity. So irifala you think, do not torment them. Do not torment women generally. Whether however they are dressed, do not torment them. Do not cat call them. Do not irritate them on a general scale. But of course, it will be more prevalent when the lady is dressed in a modest way. As I said, that some ladies say that before they wore the hijab, they would be catcalled every day, hit on every day. As soon as they wear the hijab, people offer to carry their their luggage for them and call them mamzo and stuff like that. <laughs> so the, the 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 biggest benefit of hijab is that um, a lady is treated in that way, as an equal. She's treated as a human being before a sex object, for the lack of a better word. All right. Uh, we see Ivile. Uh, so, Kim Korbaskava sexually objectified and uh, Babet so, so Reboni go, go this I keep at your young father, but seemed odd or uh, king like you know, in a business meeting, Hali Kena, or as a sign of respect, Hali, when you meet people, you shake hands with them, you know. So, I get it, uh, some they take it how I. No, my religion does not allow that. How even shaking hands, but no. come on, Ukilavan. And then I saw a law airing we should wear at love, I think. Or her lady situation, the person at your love instead of your hand. Skatseha. No, Kitaha, because I can always call the hijab PD. So I'm thinking of those days now. <laughs> um, yes, there is that ruling, uh, men, and, men and women do not uh, touch at all. There is that ruling. And then, when I believe Buaka are only about shaking hands, the ruling are women wearing gloves. There are some people who go to the opinion every time, all the time. The only thing a woman may show is her face. Leona, if hey what Leona, if her face can be fit now, she must cover it and only show her eyes. <laughs> there are the rulings go, but yes, that ruling uh, men and women should not shake hands, you're nighting. Should not shake, should not hold hands, you're nighting. I remember once when we were visiting Ayatullah Sistani, um with a group of Ziara, with Sheikh Noor and whatnot. So how the woman would shake his hand is that he would, I get it, all of us would then go and shake his hand. But then on the woman, how they would shake his hand, you cover his hand with the abaya, with the cloak, and then they would just pat on the hand. Just a light high five, Nje. No squeezing of the hand, no shaking, nothing. There's that as well. There, there are those rulings as well. Um, and yes, it's there. Just do a fist bump. Man. Hey, sister, it's on the low. <laughs> Doesn't that defeat the purpose, though? Yeah, he job. Because uh, I get is... a ruling here. Yeah? No physical contact whatsoever. 
Yes, but uh even during the time yeah like during the time yeah corona as if we are over that subhanallah what a distant memory. <laughs> uh, even the during the time star lockdown, I get you were you were encouraged or no, don't shake hands because your hands you're always rubbing your face with it. It will spread the virus, rather do with the elbow. And then there were charts even to show her, okay, no, when you uh, give a greeting, what spreads the virus more? About 95%, when you shake hands, uh, 50%, doing uh, 10%. It was crazy. So, this is, so the thing is, with a fist bump, a fist bump, um, please, it's not a fatwa. If you can avoid shaking the hand of a woman, as a man or shaking the hand of a man as a woman, do that. But uh, if push comes to shove, the least that you can do is bump. Because fist bump, I know, come on, who's off the job? I'm going to shake a moon. I'm going to shake a moon. Fish. This is the old one. I'm going to shake a Men are built different. Well, this is. But fist bump, I'm going to shake a moon. I'm going to shake a moon. You see, so it's an evil, but it's the lesser evil if push comes to shove. Rule kile kawen, rule kile kawen. Asifato amara rule kile kawen, ne? Alhamdulillah. Yemo. So we were supposed to. Uh, this is not empty, ni do. Tavaya, um, hijab for on a personal level for uh, different women. That's um, the struggles of hijab. Mm. Just one, two, because it was a request, you know. So, Reza Justice, go request your sister, inshallah. The struggles. Because, how? How do you struggle with hijab? How do you struggle with hijab? I think this struggle the government go over the whole lands and the limelight because every house has its rules. Uh, no, of course, of course, when it comes and, to okay, because of because I've interacted with uh, several sisters, Gata by Hijab, uh, it's it's difficult, uh, especially the sisters who are new. Uh, sisters who are new to Islam, it's very difficult for them. Uh, so, um. Oh, yeah, I, something just hit me. I remember, please don't take this as a fatwa. Just take it as an analysis. Uh, there's one guy, I'm just going to show you a quick analogy. So he said, I'm like, so what's stopping you? He's like, I, I enjoy alcohol too much. I'm like, yeah, and so? You know, because Alhamdulillah, we have matured. We don't say, no, haram, haram, haram. You try to talk to people on their level. So I'm like, okay, so we enjoy alcohol and then so what? It's like, so doesn't that deter me? I was like, no, look, when the Quran was revealed, when the Quran was revealed, um, the ban of alcohol was gradual. First of all, the first ruling was, don't come to prayer while you are intoxicated. So what does this mean? If unwilly, if unwele, then uh, because your prayers won't be accepted. Then comes the second level. Um, uh, then comes the second level of, of the ruling here. Alcohol. Why do I forget these verses all the time? When the first one, Akiriri, don't come to prayer while you're intoxicated. The second one uh, comes with a slightly harder ruling. Then, Indeed, it is filth from the works of the devil. So it was, the banning of alcohol came in three layers. So it's like, yeah, so, like, yeah, so when I'm a Muslim, no, let's say now, you know what you do? I get one, Saturday, or what? Hussein, two, hell no, go, and then go to the mosque and pray Fajr. Like, yeah? Like, yeah. Then Dohur Urapele Hat, then Urapele Maghrib Lirushaya. Then if you are not hard, just make sure that by Fajr you are so. I'm not giving this as a fatu. I'm giving this as a way for us as black South African Muslims who are Islam bearable. 
to our fellow brothers and sisters. The banning of alcohol came in stages. So don't Oscar don't want to change overnight. I weigh uh, I weigh over 100 kilos as it is. I'm not going to become 80 kilos overnight. It takes a process. You have to fast, you have to drink lemon coffee. Hey, you have to do this and that, exercise, or change your lifestyle. And then eventually you'll start shedding weight and get to your ideal weight, yeah, 80 kilos or 85 kilos or whatever. What this is. So even with hijab, similarly with hijab as well, we should not really force wait to tell sister to embrace her to embrace her. It's her first day go mosque. She just read up on Islam, the internet, maybe by watching MT, inshallah. And then she's interested in more Islam. And then she comes to the mosque. No, moving scarf, come. Be lenient with people. Mm. What this is. In the sense, you are not a sister. I get not well Muslim. Har rappel, or royal. How wapar? I don't know what happened. Or royal, or rappel. Then go about your day. In, it's gradual, gradual. I remember one of my teachers actually said that uh, if somebody becomes Muslim on the 29th of Shaban, they are not required to fast in the month of Ramadan. I was like, what? He's like, it's going to be diffi- too difficult for him. So, he'll fast next year. <laughs> I was like, really? He's like, yeah, man, Allah is Allah easy, man. Can I ring this early? Uh, the one that we used to argue, um, or no, we can join our prayers. Allah did not make the religion tedious and difficult. So the difficulty is the hijab detain. So now I'm speaking to Muslim sisters because I don't like authority over them. <laughs> Baba, so when you talk to non-Muslim sisters, don't force her for the apparatus to go immediately. Make it gradual. Just tell her, no, sister, I'm rappel. Then when she asks you, no, it's because um, even the Bible says, Musadi Harapela, Tanza Rale, blah, blah, There are many arguments you can come up with. Then, yeah, now make it a journey for her. Yeah, now she must fall in love with her job and eventually start to wear it on her own, out of love, not out of compulsion. Look, I'm not brother. If you marry a non Muslim sister, and then now what you know, yeah, more, more, and she's not a Muslim. Tandu Rale, Tandu Lorele, ah, Tomu Bor. She's going to rebel. But if you make it a gradual thing whereby you tell her, oh, no, this is why you wear hijab. See the benefits of hijab. Uh, when you pray, please wear hijab. This, 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 this. Then later she grows and understands and then she falls in love with it and does it out of her own will, not being forced. Because it's very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. There People who have, I know sisters who have fought with their family members because of the job. Yeah, we get a, we get a, yeah, it's difficult, it's difficult. So, us as Muslims, men or women, should make it easy upon those who struggle with the job. It's, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a thing. People struggle with the job. So the same way that person uh, should not come to prayer drunk, the same way this one must not come to prayer as a wrong. Outside of prayer, something else. So when you tell somebody for Askatla Kusfala Anwin, what does it do? Wanahanor, so vele it means na go na after after seven vele. Then himself is going to decide on his own for let me stop drinking because it's too difficult. I have to drink after a shower and sleep and wake and wake up sober, and then only then I can pray. Let me stop this thing altogether. So let that lady also bring hijab. Mutakurad, she must always carry a scarf in her bag. It's a She's like, why don't I just wear this? 
but make it her, she it must be her own journey she must grow in it on her own not by force yeah now i'm not i'm not the the, the hijab pd anymore I'm the hijab police commissioner <laughs> Yes, 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 Lieutenant Colonel. This is why we should listen to scholars and not to bosses. But in Boda, but at his struggles and the bad they were things are being higher level, where level, where level. This is why you are the specialist, Ralebo, 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 Ercopa, or Inshallah, or a colleague, Matabello. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma atliq bihi al-sinatana with dua and some of it. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائلا وحصرا ودليلا عينا حتى تسكنه أرضك الطوعا وتمدعهم فيها طويلا ومن علينا برضا وهب لنا رفتك ورحمتك ودعاك وثيرا وفقنا من مصارك وعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه اللي بخيلي نقولونا يا من الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام um thank you for viewing for being viewers إن شاء الله um that is it from us Mtini. Um, oh, before Kuala, don't forget you can suggest the topic, inshallah, that you want discussed. Um, yeah, I think that's it from us, inshallah. Um, Mtini, where we take from the tree, learn from the tree, and develop from the tree. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه